Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the open forum number 20 of the IGF 2023 on benefits and challenges of uh, immersive uh, realities. Uh, let me start by pre presenting our uh, speakers today. I will start with uh, uh, on-site panelists in uh, alphabetical order. So we have with us uh, Adam Ingo, uh, Global Lead in Digital Policy from the Lego Group. We have uh, Clara Neppel, Senior Director, European Business Operations at IEEE. Um, and we have Patrick Penix, Head of the Information Society Department from the Council of Europe. And the Council of Europe is the organizer also of, um, of this event. In remote participation, we have uh, Professor Melodina Stevens, uh, Professor of Innovation and Technology Governance from the Ho Mohammed bin Rashid School of um, Government, and Yu Yuan uh, from I, uh, IEEE, um, IEEE SA President. Welcome. Um, my name is Irene Kitsada. I'm European Standardization Initiatives Director at uh, IEEE SA. I have the pleasure to be the lead of the uh, upcoming uh, Council of Europe and IEEE joint report on uh, the impact um, on the metaverse and its impact on human rights, the rule of law and democracy. And I will be your moderator today. So let me start by asking Patrick and Clara um, why the Council of Europe is organizing this session today and working on issues uh, related to emerging technologies and also what is the role of uh, IEEE in this? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, for the Council of Europe, it's been an imperative to always work uh, at the edge of the developments of technology. Um, Already in the 80s, we worked on the uh, Data Protection Convention. In the uh, later on, um, 20 years ago, we developed the Cybercrime Convention. So we're always trying to ensure that the new technological developments are compatible with the values of the Council of Europe. And that's why also in, in terms of the uh, uh, emerging um, new technology, which is encompassed through artificial intelligence, and uh, the immersive realities, we also need to see to which extent this coincides and this reinforces or poses a certain number of challenges to the development of human rights. Uh, so I'll have to start again, I guess. Um, <laughs> the, what I was trying to say is that uh, the Council of Europe has always been at the edge when it comes to uh, the development of new technologies, when we try to look at uh, the development of uh, everything, uh, automated processing of uh, individual data already 40 years ago, or the Cybercrime Convention more than 20 years ago, for us it was always very important to be able to uh, look at what the uh, impact of those emerging technologies, and this, w this way the immersive realities, uh, have on human rights, rule of law, and democracy. And that's why we thought it was important to work in partnership with IEEE uh, on looking into the metaverse and how the metaverse would impact those human rights. And that's why we decided to organize this workshop here. Thank you. And thank you for uh, having us here. Um, so my name is Clara Neppel and uh, I'm uh, the senior director of IEEE in Europe. We are based in Austria and Vienna. And when I, on my flight here, um, I actually saw a documentary from a famous uh, Austrian architect, uh, Karl Schwanzer, who said that man creates buildings and buildings create man. And actually it's the responsibility of an architect to create these buildings that which make people happy. And now we are at the um, at a time when we create a completely new virtual reality, and we are the architects. Um, and I think that we cannot do it alone as technologists. I think that we need to create a immersive reality which makes people happy, which uh, cares for well-being, and of course also human rights uh, uh, and the society. And we need to bring also in this report, that's what we try to do, to bring different perspectives. So from the technological side, uh, from the ethical side, social side. And um, yes, this is basically this bi-directional dialogue that we need to continue also for this sense. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick and Clara. 
Um, so we are hearing the terms uh, metaverse, uh, immersive realities, and also in other sessions we, we have also related terms such as uh, virtual worlds, and I think it would be good for our discussion to, um, to talk a little bit about this, uh, these terms and maybe the, as well as the, um, um, the technologies that are uh, enabling making the, uh, such realities um, um, an option and uh, making it possible for us to experience. So with that, I would like to turn to you to uh, provide us with uh, his perspective on this. Uh. Thank you, Irene. So as we all know, uh, Metaverse, this term was coined by Neil Stephenson in his sci-fi uh, fiction novel uh, back in, uh, well, 30 years ago. Uh, but uh, during the uh, past decades, this concept itself uh, has been uh, extended uh, quite a bit. So let me share with you uh, our definition of metaverse. We are trying to uh, provide the most uh, inclusive definition for metaverse. So, you know, uh, in terms of metaverse, we could agree that this is uh, talking about a digital uh, universe. So from the experience perspe perspective, experience view, we can say there are three types of metaverses. It could be either a digital and a different universe or it could be a digital counterpart of our current universe, or it could be a digital, digital extension of our current universe, which means these three different types of uh, digital universes uh, are corresponding to virtual reality, augmented reality, and the digital twin. Uh, so from that perspective, metaverse refers to a kind of experiences in which the outside world is perceived as a universe. But uh, from an, another, another, another angle, uh, the functional view uh, uh, you of the internet. Uh, well, how about now? Let me uh, say again. Could you hear yes, me? Please. Hello? Now we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. So, okay. So, uh, uh, we know like a uh, metaverse from another perspective, we call that a functional view. Uh, metaverse could be referred to the next version of World War Web, web 3.0 will be the next stage of digital transformation. So with that being said, let me take, let, let, let's take a look at the metaverse technology landscape. We can say that, of course, uh, uh, supporting technologies like uh, computation, storage, communications, networking, data and knowledge and intelligence are all necessary for uh, enable, uh, enabling metaverse. But there are also core technologies for metaverse. Uh, namely extended senses and actions, you can call that XR, or you can call that spatial computing. And this, the second category is persistent virtual worlds, you, uh, we call that persistent computing, which is about how to create virtual maps, virtual scenes, uh, virtual objects, and the virtual characters collectively constituting virtual worlds. And lastly, digital finance and economy, you can also call that consensus computing, which is about uh, digital assets, uh, may or may not be built upon decentralization and the blockchain. Uh, so from this technology roadmap uh, or landscape, you can say that AI is actually an integral part of the metaverse technology landscape. So with that being said, we can say that the metaverse is the next biggest thing. Why? Uh, because if we look at the history of the digitalization or digital transformation, we are actually between two stages. Uh, the current stage, uh, which is already exploding, is we call that intelligentization, which is about uh, the rise of AI, using AI everywhere. Uh, but the next phase in by AI and uh, uh, its upcoming is the metaverse. So we are currently between these two stages. And I could also add that, uh, as we, many of uh, us will agree that uh, AI is transforming production, transforming forces of production and the relations of production, but the metaverse will redefine production and redefine life. So that's why we say metaverse is the next biggest thing. So I'll stop here. Aaron? Thank you very much, Hugh. Um, and uh, you, you touched upon um, uh, some of the, the fact, you know, that we have different uh, um, areas of application of the metaverse. And uh, I would like to uh, now turn to Melodina and ask her uh, about some application areas and then uh, move to uh, Clara, Benefit and Adam and talk about some of the benefits that can um, arise from the use of immersive uh, experience and um, 
uh, ways that the, that the metaverse can also uh, promote, for example, the human rights, the rule of law and democracy. Uh, Melodina, would you like to start? Thank you. So when Meta, the, when Facebook changed its name to Meta in October 2021, the market speculated that the total size of Metaverse is 13 trillion US dollars. Over time, that number got revised and went downwards, but I do not think it is a wrong estimate at all. For the first reason is Metaverse is also hardware, so you see this doubling of computing power every 18 months. You also see a lot of the geopolitical tension is pushing the adoption of Metaverse. You can see this in the 5G wars and in the proxy uh, wars currently going on. You also see private sector's tremendous interest. In fact, the applied research from private sector is greater than government investment. And you see this in things like, for example, Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard uh, for about 69 billion US dollars. We also see governments are huge adopters, and I'm going to go through that very briefly, but we see a standards war coming out, and it's being played by the private sector currently. You see Pokemon Go, which was an augmented reality game, got uh, 50 million customers in 19 days, so that's huge adoption curve. You see also a price war happening right now with Meta's Oculus glasses priced at 500 versus Apple's glasses priced at 3,500, all in time for Christmas. So gaming continues to drive the metaverse right now. There's more than 160 virtual worlds. Um, Fortnite, for example, has half a billion customers and generates something like six billion US dollars. A lot of this income is also micro purchasing. We can't ignore other players which have huge numbers, for example, Meta with 3.88 billion users. Microsoft with most of the Fortune 500, and keep in mind Microsoft has a Microsoft Mesh, and now has Activision, that's 92 million monthly users, and Minecraft, significant number of children. Apple has 1.5 billion users entering into the payment circle, and Google has 4.3 billion tens and 1.26. And we see NVIDIA, which was typically a hardware provider, now entering into this space. So the crossovers are very interesting, and that's why I think it's very hard to determine market. Now, industry applications are, for example, in digital twins. We have countries adopting, uh, well, cities, for example, and countries. UK has a digital twin strategy, for example. South Korea has one, but we also see cities adopting it. We see manufacturing, there are factories that are adopting it, creating digital twins, Siemens, BMW. So ge definitely Germany. We see it in utility sector, Sydney Water. We see it in ADNOC, which is petroleum, oil and gas. We see 900 cities with smart cities. So with the internet of all things, I think this is also pushing the adoption of the metaverse. We have 125 billion connected devices in 2023. We see government, which historically has contributed 40% to GDP, approximately in uh, maybe at the higher end, but also entering. So for example, tourism, uh, during the pandemic, uh, Dubai was present as World Expo. They had 24 physical visitors coming to the site. It was COVID after all, but 125 virtual uh, visitors. And this becomes part of their legacy. We see KSA with Neom and Finland in, my, in Minecraft, actually, with the 3D version of Helsinki as a city. We see education as a huge adopter. Typically, it's being pushed by engineering and health and that's also where a lot of the research is happening right now there was the first surgery but it was more to access digital records and some work is happening on customer care uh, a lot on reskilling for example Accenture bought 60,000 Oculus Quest headsets in 2021 for their employees and they created the nth floor for training and for networking uh, we also see retail heavily getting involved in the metaverse. Typically right now it's more experiences. Brands are testing it out. We've got luxury brands like Gucci, Burberry, fashion brands like H&M Forever 21. I mean, you name it, they are there, but they're experimenting right now. There is no doubt we will reach 13 trillion. I think it's a function of standards or maybe who will win the standards war and also what is the situation with regulation. So I'll stop there right now, Irene. Thank you, Melodina. Patrick?
Well, uh, well it's um, is it on? Yes, it is on. Okay. Well, there are the question that uh, Vince Cerf just asked in the opening uh, session of the high-level um, opening remarks was what is the internet we want and what is the internet we deserve. So these are two different questions and the same goes for the metaverse. What is the metaverse we want and which one do we deserve? I think if, if we want to uh, create a metaverse that is respectful of human rights, that will enhance freedom of expression, that will be inclusive, that will be accessible, that will be fostering global connections. We need to put those milepoles and benchmarks in place. And that's why we cannot just let digital development happen. We have to be able to steer that digital development. I wouldn't say that we need to steer innovation. I think that is for companies to do. But we need to put those benchmarks right that make sure that there are within the metaverse also innovative educational opportunities that there are that there is a democratic participation that there is a digital rights protection we very often at the, at the level of the council of europe say um, what is the protection of rights that we need to do offline we also need to do that online if the metaverse is the next step up with the Internet of Things, with connected realities, with 5G, with quantum computing, and how that interrelates all together. And certain industries are very far ahead. You didn't say that earlier on, but for example, testing of, in the metaverse, how it feels to be underwater, for example. These are innovations that we need to be able to, um, not grasp, but at least to be able to say, what usage do we want it to give in the future? Um, I could imagine that not only it gives you the feeling of jumping off a cliff into the ocean, which is the b would be the fantastic use of the metaverse, I guess, but if we are able to use the metaverse in order to do waterboarding, this may be a completely different reality. So we need transparency, we need accountability, we need digital rights protection. And I think it the experience already shows that we need to be able to give a certain guidance on that. We're trying to do that in the technologies that are being developed. Right now we're developing uh, a regulation on artificial intelligence, which is a framework convention that is to be dealing with this. We hope to finalize that by mid next year, um, but also in our future work plans, the metaverse is part of it. And the fact that we can work together with IEEE on those kind of things seems to me essential, because uh, as, as we said before, it's in this multi-stakeholder context that we need to be able to discuss that from all angles, whether that be from the technical community, from the engineer's point of view, from the business point of view, but also from an ethical point of view, from civil society point of view, academic point of view, and be able to govern all of that. So I think the benefits are there, and we can work towards the promotion of human rights and rule of law and democratic participation, but it's not going to go evidently. We've seen that with the, with the development of the internet. The internet has given us a number of opportunities. We want it to be open and transparent and flexible and worldwide, but we're increasingly getting a more fragmented world. And we also know that if we let things happen, if we want a meta not want a metaverse, but if we get a get a metaverse we deserve, we may not be getting the metaverse we want. And I think that's important from a human rights perspective to look at it. Clara and then Adam uh, on the benefits of... Oh, uh, yeah, of thank the you. 
Well, um, I think we already heard quite a lot on the benefits. Um, I was also thinking, uh, again, on my flight to, to Japan, uh, that probably already immersive realities contributed this flight and your flight as well to be more safe because the pilot was um, probably trained by hours and hours in immersive realities to master situation which he hopefully never uh, encounters or <laughs> not very often. And um, so this is already an immersive reality which helps us. And uh, we are seeing now, uh, we hear generative AI. Um, generative AI is going to revolutionize also design. Uh, we are going to have the car industry, which is already um, testing out different design options in uh, different um, immersive realities. And um, I think that we are moving now, for we heard from these digital twins of cities, uh, and um, I think somebody asked to uh, try to map it to SDG, so I will just uh, try to do some. The obvious one, of course, would be the SDG 9, uh, Industry Innovation and Infrastructure. But if you go to the digital twins of cities and even of the planet, uh, of course, we also touching about the SDG 3, uh, sorry, uh, 13 on climate and also of sustainable cities. Uh, and uh, we are moving to the digital twins of ourselves. And I think that this is where uh, our, our collaboration with uh, the Council of Europe is going to be essential because there we are entering a realm that we certainly cannot handle alone when it comes to human rights, democracy and rule of law. Um, and um, so digital twins of ourselves, what does it mean? It means, of course, inclusive health, uh, healthcare, SDG 3. Uh, education was already mentioned, SDG 4. But what is very close to my heart is really SDG 17, and that is partnership. It's partnership for these common goals. And I think that this is going to be now really a game changer. Now, if we're thinking about climate change, we see quite a lot of uh, measures well, which are very, very difficult to implement because citizens don't understand the full impact of it. And there's a lot of fear. What does it mean if a solar panel is, um, is uh, very close to my um, you know, field or if I have a wind turbine uh, somewhere nearby? Uh, what does it mean if my city is going to implement new measures uh, uh, in terms of traffic control. And this is something that we can try out in a virtual reality. And we can have, we can really enhance the democratic participation that Patrick uh, talked about. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I, I think the, the benefits have been well canvassed, but I, um, I'm from the Lego group, so I'll, I'll focus my comments um, on what it might mean for, for children. and. Really, um, it has tremendous potential to amplify the things that kids care about. Um, so we've undertaken research alongside UNICEF um, to try and understand what is child well-being online and what components and elements and building blocks actually make children feel um, like they're in a positive space. Um, one of them is social connection. Um, I think the metaverse and the immersivity of it and the interoperability between different layers um, of the internet and different services can really connect children in a way um, that, you know, is unprecedented. Um, you know, you're not just a username, you're an avatar, um, you have a, a sense of identity that's carried across experiences that built, that's built up through a history online, um, and that conveys a unique sense of yourself to your peers and other um, uh, other other kids. Um, so you can connect in a way um, that that um, you haven't been able before, and, and that's really what kids value. Um, you can create in a way uh, that you can't do um, on off offline, um, even with Lego bricks. Um, you are able to, you know, really build these worlds around you. Um, you've seen the power of Minecraft, Roblox, what's happening in Fortnite. These are all early metaverses. Um, as the technology improves, not just the graphics, but the interconnectivity, the layers of services, you know, the creative potential is huge. And children learn through creation. You know, that's what we've really found. Um, so they can do that in, a, in an even better way. Um, you also can empower kids. Um, you know, they have this sense of identity. They're online, they're engaging. Um, they're building their own lives there. And they really value this kind of sense of empowerment. Um, often, you know, they can find some inter interactions quite patronizing, um, but, you know, they have a right of access to the benefits of technology. Um, and, 
in the metaverse is, is an avenue for that. So they can learn, create, connect, um, do all these things. Um, now, I know we're getting to the downsides later, but I, I do want to say there's a massive caveat to all that is, you know, these things need to be done in a responsible way, particularly with children. So social connection, you know, it's, it, we've, we've seen the harms that come through an unconsidered approach to those types of things. Um, so the benefit's tremendous, but it needs to be done right. Hopefully that's a good segue. Absolutely, <laughs> thank you for that. And I think uh, we have the spoiler alert in the title of the, of the session about the challenges. And I think uh, this is part of what uh, a lot of sessions in the IGF are addressing around concerns that come with emerging technologies and applications. So um, I would like to address uh, this question to, um, uh, to all our pan panelists about what are the s some of the challenges that could arise from uh, immersive realities and what is the potential impact they could have um, on the human rights, the rule of law and democracy, remembering the organizer of the event. Uh, and let us maybe, um, maybe just give um, a bit of a background on what we have uh, um, covered in the upcoming report. Um, so we have looked into, on one side, the enabling um, environment that the immersive uh, realities and the metaverse can create for um, exercising human rights and uh, the rule of law and democracy. But um, other um, issues we have looked into were uh, related to privacy and data protection, uh, safety and security, protection of children um, and other vulnerable populations, access and accessibility issues, inclusion and non-discrimination, freedom of expression and censorship, labor environment, and of course um, issues related to the rule of law such as territoriality, um, enforcement, access to justice, and democracy. But before we all <laughs> despair, maybe let's start by some of these issues, and I will start by um, Clara, and then we can move to Patrick, Melodina, and Adam. Thank you. Uh, so I already mentioned that we have already very practical um, examples of virtual reality. So we have autonomous cars being tried out in different scenarios. But even there, uh, there are certain ethical questions. A cow on the street might have a completely different value in India than in Europe. And now if we have these digital twins or avatars or human, uh, digital humans, of course we are entering a completely new territory. Uh, these um, these digital humans interacting now in a seamless interconnected space. Um, there is uh, who is going to control that space? So until now, these uh, immersive realities have been, and also the rules of engagements have been designed by private actors. Now, if we have something like a pu public space, who is going to decide? Who is going to enter that space? Uh, what is acceptable behavior? And when and when somebody should be excluded. So here again, we are also discussing about an inclusive, as much as con uh, inclusive uh, space as possible. We already see a shift of paradigm from um, the moderation of control that we know from AI and social media to uh, the moderation of behavior and, mo and moderation of, s of space. Uh, what does it mean to be aggressed in the in a virtual space? And um, again. Uh, if we are discussing about virtual spaces, what is a public infrastructure? To what extent can people co-create actually that infrastructure? And what does it mean then to ownership? Um, we already see our children in Minecraft creating magnific magnificent cities and so on. What does it mean if this is then incorporated in, um, in a private uh, virtual space? Who is, whose ownership is it? And again, um, who is dictating the rules? Um, in, um, in, in the digital space, we have in open source uh, the governance of um, you know, who is actually uh, controlling what code is getting into it. We had uh, some time ago something like a benevolent dictator, somebody who is dictating who, which code should, should be part of that uh, service. So are we going to have something like this in a digital space? Hopefully not. Hopefully we will have a democratic participation. And um, especially when it comes to uh, such a technology which will um, very much influence our worldviews because we are basically going to uh, have a completely different perception of, let's say, a certain uh, environment if we are immersed in it, this. 
who is going to, again, uh, control how this is going to look like? What does it mean, our well, perception of history, of perception of, of reality as such? And um, I think we already heard about privacy. Um, I think we are entering here into a completely new space. Uh, we are going to have uh, this technology which is co um, present, omnipresent, uh, we, and we have to get away, let's say, from the technologies that we hear now, of the headsets. We have to think about technologies which are upcoming. Last week at the uh, Paris fashion show, uh, something called a human AI was presented, which was just a very small pin, which is there all the time and registering basically everything, recording everything. It's kind of a digital assistant, a Star Trek-like assistant. Um, question is, uh, what would it mean into this conference if we had such a technology which is every time recording everything which is happening, recording who is talking to what, to whom, and what possibly feelings uh, he has. So you can imagine the uh, type of information asymmetry that we are going to have and also the power uh, of those who can also predict certain alliances, certain power games in the future. Uh, so you can see we have certain new aspects to existing ethical challenges like privacy, bias, uh, accountability, and we have also some completely new uh, challenges. Uh, we had Tom Hanks also last week telling that uh, there is a digital uh, Tom Hanks around who is uh, publicizing some dental care. He has nothing to do with him with this. Uh, we have more and more of these digital uh, twins who are going, um, yeah, going to be copied. Uh, not only our, um, you know, our physical um, um, features, but also uh, our characteristics. Our um, um, the way we are uh, talking and the way we are feeling. So how much can we actually control uh, these digital selves or these digital uh, feelings? And um, are we going to need to have an authentication not only of content but also of these uh, digital humans? And last but not least, I want to conclude with safety. I think that um, safety is also going to play an, a completely different um, role that we are discussing now in terms of AI. Uh, maybe some of you have, um, uh, have heard this adver advertisement that the metaverse is virtual but its impact is real. And I think that's very true. Of course, uh, you will have uh, very real impacts when it comes, for instance, to uh, healthcare. But if it is not designed well, then it has a real impact on a patient. And uh, other things uh, which, uh, which makes this um, uh, this, uh, this, this need of designing it the right way, a very important one. Now, the human rights activists, but also organizations that uh, stand for human rights, are very often seen as a little bit alarmist and do not see sufficiently uh, the positive sides. But it's also for a human rights organization to be able to uh, point that out. Uh, the let's say the um, the ones that are the evangelists, if I may call them that way, of the um, future developments, including the immersive realities, will point at the will point at the advantages. They also do serious efforts. Um, I'm now not speaking for that business community, but it's not as if that business community goes about developing things in a completely unethical way. They put quite a number of um, resources into place. Um, Metaverse, unfortunately, um, or Meta was unfortunately not able to, to participate in, in this uh, panel discussion, but I know they do a lot of effort in order to be able to ensure that the ethical principles, human rights principles, legal principles are also being respected. I will, Adam will certainly say something more about it afterwards as well because that's their prime concern. Uh, well, not their prime concern. Their prime concern remains doing business, obviously. But the question is not so much how much ethical principles are being put forward by private business. It's also to which extent this new universe is going to be regulated by private business or to which extent has a uh, democratic society with the 
principles that it endorses and tries to promote, to which extent does that have an impact on the development of this new immersive reality? None of us here are immersive natives. I'm an analog native. Some of us may be digital natives. <laughs> I'm not looking at anyone in particular. But none of us are immersive r natives. We will have to be able to look into uh, a completely new reality of which we do not necessarily yet see the contours. And in order to be able to see those contours, let us not be naive. Um, I'm old enough to have looked at the start of the internet and the positive feelings about uh, democratic governance and participation and improvement of, uh, let's say, grassroots democracy. But we also see that that was maybe a little bit naive and that we also see that there are a number of things that we need to ensure that especially when our societies are, instead of growing more democratic, are getting more defensive of human rights, we are regressing. We are backsliding. So let us see what that means. If some of the information and data that have been collected even until now fall into the wrong hands, I think we are very badly off. Now, the metaverse also and the immersive realities allows for new forms of crime, in form, uh, allows for new questions or has to be put new questions with regards to the jurisdiction. Where, uh, who is going to be judge and party? Can we be judge and party? Should we not divide that? Should we not have the ones that are deciding on how the developments are taking place be separated from those who take a number of decisions with regards to the jurisdiction about it? Now, we, we've spoken about privacy. Clara mentioned it before. We're getting into a new dimension of privacy because in order to create an immersive reality, we also need to ensure that new forms of data collection, including uh, biometric psychography, um, are, are recorded. These are very intimate, more even, I would say, then our health data, which are sensitive data, how are they going to be governed? I think even if, who was it? Tom Hanks? No. Tom Hanks. Was it Tom Hanks? Complains about deep fakes. I think in the future we will be dealing with something which is far more um, um, immersive than that. Um, I think we're, we're moving towards, um, in order to be able to represent yourself through an avatar, it basically means that you have to have a complete picture of yourself, including of your um, expressions, etc., etc., to make it more realistic. Will we in 30, uh, no, in 2034, will the IGF take place in an immersive world? So these are the kind of things that we need to ask and what are the uh, consequences of that for privacy and digital security? How do we identify ourselves? Not only Tom Hanks, but also everyone in our room here. What about anonymity? Can we still be anonymous? We're outraged about video surveillance and some countries and some cities are excelling in that. But what about anonymity? What about private life? At least for the European Convention on Human Ri Life, privacy is one of the pillars, Article 8. What about freedom of expression? What about the counterpart of disinformation and misinformation? We see, especially now with the ongoing war, how misinformation and disinformation are being used 
in a 30s, 1930-like manner, but in much more efficient manner to be able to stifle freedom of expression, but also to control whole forms of population. That immersive reality can only be um, an extra layer of that. And I think we need to not be naive in terms of thinking that everyone is nice. Not everyone is nice. At the IGF, of course, everyone <laughs> is nice. <laughs> but there are other people out there which may be not so nice and that have different intentions on how your private information will be used. Um, let's also think about inclusivity. The speeches earlier today were all about how can we uh, make the next 2.6 billion people connect to the internet. But how are we going to connect the next 8 billion people to the metaverse? Who is going to be included? What are the elements of inclusion? I see the potential for educational purposes and so on and so forth, but in order to be able to benefit from those educational goals, we have to be able to ensure that people can also participate. So inclusivity, accessibility. How are we dealing with the digital divide, not only worldwide, but also within our societies? And that is something that has also been shown in, in during the COVID crisis, how the digital divide in our countries have been uh, extremely um, difficult to overcome. So governance and accountability. It's good to be accountable to yourself, but you can also get away with certain things. I try to be accountable, but I'm not always so accountable. Don't tell anyone, but that's the reality. If you're judge and party, you cannot be totally objective. So we need to, uh, in this multi-stakeholder approach, come to common sense. I think this IGF also uh, points at it, that is that we need to be able to, on the basis of a number of uh, common principles, common values, how do we want to see the next step, not only in internet governance and artificial intelligence, but how do we also measure that in terms of the immersive realities and how are we going to position ourselves to that? Are we going to be naive in hoping that the next generation will be simple and will be uh, defensive or not? Thank you. Um, let's now move to Melodina. And being aware of time, uh, I'm, uh, I'm asking all the speakers onwards to be uh, conscious of that so that we leave uh, time for the Q&A. Melodina? Yes, thank you. So I would like to very briefly talk about uh, the Universal Human Rights uh, Article 23, which says everyone has the right to work, the free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work and protection against unemployment. The metaverse is data hungry, so it basically consumes your data, just like Clara and Patrick have mentioned. And the worry is it will remove jobs. For the first time, the World Economic Forum in their 2023 report has actually said AI technologies like metaverse will be a net uh, job uh, loss, not a jet net job increase. And that means we will not be prepared because now skills don't matter. Your experience doesn't matter because it's all saved on the metaverse. And this, the cost of not preparing people to have jobs or to keep jobs will be something like 11.5 trillion for training. But even more, if you look at things like pensions or social security, the bigger worry is the jobs that are being formed are often low paying jobs. So the human being is coming to the bottom of the supply chain, right? And we see this already because some of the jobs are things like tagging uh, content or content moderation. Uh, I'll give you an example. For example, Roblox has a very active community and they have 4.25 million developers. And if you 
want to earn on Roblox and convert their money, that is the Roblox to actual US dollars, uh, you have to make a minimum amount of money. And of that 4.25 million developers, only 11,000 qualified. This has a direct impact on health, and that's another universal right, right? And the impact is well-being, especially the uncertainty whether I get to keep my job, I think is important. So this also raises questions on IP. Uh, assuming my experiences and my skill sets are because of the amount of years I spend and are uniquely mine, do I have IP on this? We also see another important thing coming in, which is perhaps behavioral addiction to technologies like this. I mentioned right at the beginning, a lot of the metaverse has been built from gaming. So we try to gamify behavior. And we know for children, as an example, that many of the so not just children, uh, adults also can get addicted to games. So this has been declared a psychiatric uh, disorder in 2019 by WHO. But the worry is as we start putting it into our daily life, in shopping, in work, and in education, at what point will the so-called magic circle, the circle between reality and imagination disappear? This is something we aren't actually putting enough research into. I would also like to very briefly bring in environment. Clara mentioned that, but the metaverse is something that requires huge amounts of data and computing power. Hence, it has a significant carbon footprint, right? Just take the semiconductor chip, which is embedded in most of our technology. If you've got a mobile phone or a laptop, uh, the average chip, when you take all of its components, travels 50 thousand kilometers right and it's embedded in 169 industries so we're looking at environmental costs uh in carbon in terms of water because chips are not recycled we see that the e-waste is growing exponentially and less than 17 percent is recycled so this will get into your groundwater and something like mercury we see that in fish across the ocean so it's not contained uh, we also, I just want to briefly mention one more thing, but culture representation becomes extremely important in the metaverse, and I think this will be something nations will have to consider, whether it's stereotypes that are being represented on the metaverse, or how do you actually do that. So with that, Adam, over to you. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll keep it brief because um, a lot of the challenges have, have been discussed. Um, I think one thing that has come out though and always comes out in these discussions is um, how so many of the issues aren't unique um, they exist today and we're still grappling with the solutions today and now regulation and legislation um, is, is forming a response to these issues um, so i think we'll actually have to wait and see how the issues in web 2.0 and the regulatory response um, and the cultural response to these issues plays out to see whether you know we'll actually start in earnest with the metaverse from a better playing field. Um, but when it comes to kids and the challenges they, they, they face, you know, I think from our mind, um, from Allegro's mind, we want to create a really kid-friendly ecosystem, one with high safety standards, responsible design, um, you know, limited um, ways for harmful contact, conduct, contract. Um, and in order to do that, to create a truly immersive ecosystem, we need others to join us and also share our standards because you know we can create all these great Lego experiences, but a metaverse is interconnected, it, it's, inter it's interoperable. So everyone needs to lift their game if we're going to have a collective approach to address a lot of the harms that, that, that children are gonna be facing. Uh, again, Adam, thank you for leading to the, to the last question. And again, uh, because of time, I would ask uh, uh, the rest of you to cover, um, we are at the IGF, so uh, naturally the last question is around governance of the, of the metaverse. Um, and uh, could you share some uh, key concepts, um, you know, uh, the issues we have been hearing and the uh, considerations and challenges are very much, uh, I think, uh, known issues from ongoing or previous discussions uh, related to AI, generative AI, social platforms, and, and gaming. How can we address some of these challenges that we heard, and what could be some of the considerations um, and elements we should bear in mind while considering governance of immersive realities? Um, Patrick, would you like to start? Um, or Melodina. Melodina, would you like to start? 
Sure. So uh, when we look at the governance right now, I just want to quote something from ITU in 2003, an IGF committed to the WSIS principles, which says, commitment to build people-centric, inclusive, and development-oriented information society. I sometimes worry whether we put technology before people. So we see that there's a lot at the national level in terms of policies. OECD re uh, reports 800 AI policies. Most of them are in North Africa and Europe. And we also see a lot of data regulations, 62 countries with 144 data regulations, but most of it is fragmentary. So the metaverse will be global and it really requires uh, collaboration across governments. The few governments that have put policies on the metaverse, most of them recommend self-governance. And I think this is because of the adoption curve. So you see South Korea came out with ethical principles. Uh, the Agile Nations, which is a coalition group, it's an IGO with UK, Canada, Denmark, Italy, Singapore, Japan, and UAE is coming out with a report in, in this week. And again, it talks about self-governance. China, for the first time, has actually said you could file trademarks of NFTs and virtual goods. And this is a big shift that's coming in. And Australia has a white paper on standards. But again, self-governance, because the time to collaborate and put together an overarching policy will take too long and we need private sector to work with that. Now, there are standards coming out. So if we look at something like the metaverse standards, which is an association with 2,400 members, most of it private sector. Now, one of the challenges I would like to bring is open source. So the metaverse builds on top of open source and there's a proprietary layer. And this really creates a problem. So take, for example, a database of faces. So Megapixel had a data set of 4.7 million faces scrapped from Flickr. Today, you can do it from Instagram or from YouTube. And 80% of that was from these places. And it's used in 900 research papers. So we see this open source does have some challenges that I'd like to hide, uh, highlight. Another one is Apache software. There's something called the log4j, and this is responsible for the 404 error that you see. And they found out there was a problem in its code that created a vulnerability. And what's interesting is it's embedded everywhere, in Amazon, in Apple, in uh, Minecraft, and all Java systems, and that's 3 billion devices. So we will see that this problem will exist. And it's not really how much foresight you have in that, but how quickly and how transparently we can work together. If we penalize private sector for being transparent, they will hide it and it will make the vulnerability worse. So that's something we need to find. We find out also that there isn't much uh, way forward. For example, Barbados wanted to put an embassy online. And according to the 1961 Vienna Convention, it talks about only physical embassies. But these are countries with limited resources. And if they need to be represented around the world, virtual embassies work. But again, this is a negotiated thing where there isn't much information on that. I just want to highlight one more thing. Most governments who are being represented on the metaverse are being represented on top of the private sector. So they're using something like Decentraland or the SANS and working with that. So I think this raises also interesting questions, at which point I'd like to stop now and hand over. Thank you, Melodina. Patrick? Yeah, when you speak about governance, I think uh, there is a number of uh, governance principles which are re already enshrined in what uh, we've done in, on data protection, what we've done on cybercrime, uh, what we're now trying to do also on artificial intelligence within, within the Council of Europe, questions related to responsibility, to transparency, to explainability, to revocability, to the right to contest. All of those elements need to be looked at. And obviously, what we did when, when we started to work on the uh, co new Convention on Artificial Intelligence, the first thing we did was some kind of a feasibility study. That is, look at what are all the ethical principles that are already out there and which are applicable. What is the legislation that is out there and that would be applicable to the metaverse? And then look at where are the gaps. And if we have identified the gaps, then look at how, which are the elements that could constitute the elements of a future governance within this. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. 
Um, well, I think that what we hear now uh, more and more from the private sector as well is that the there's a need for the interoperability of regulation, actually, for uh, regulatory requirements. And uh, one way uh, to achieve this could be, uh, is actually through global standards. And um, I think that it is important to say that standards are there, of course, to move from uh, principles to practice to actually operationalize regulations. So this is, would be the top-down approach, uh, and this is important, but we also see a bottom-up approach. So uh, in IEEE, we've been working since 2015 on um, ethically aligned design initiatives, which resulted in a set of standards from value-based uh, design, which can be used also for the metaverse, uh, to defining more closely what is transparency, what does it mean to have age-appropriate design. I think, Adam, you're part of that. Um, and um, so I think that we need to bring together this top-down and bottom-up uh, up principles in order to uh, create that framework which works for everyone. Um, yeah, I think I will just <laughs> let it here because uh, we want to have some questions as well. Thank you. Uh, yes, and I would like now to, to turn to you and uh, to the audience and uh, see if you have any questions to our panelists. And then I hear we also have an online uh, question. Maybe <coughs> we can start with that. And you can think in the meantime. Can you, yes. So I will just read the question in the chat uh, from Nina Jane Patel. Uh, with the increasing immersion of users into these virtual realms, there is potential access to a plethora of biometric data, from eye tracking to brain activity to heart rate. How do you envision the governance and regulation of such intimate data in the metaverse? Furthermore, what steps do you believe need to be taken to ensure that individuals' biometric data remain private and protected from the misuse. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so I can address what we have uh, identified in the report. Maybe that will give an, oops, an overview of some of the issues that have been identified by, um, by the experts. So um, indeed, we're, we will be looking into much more invasive um, uh, you know, uh, practical supervision and uh, censoring. And um, the idea is we will be looking, uh, so our experts have been looking into the idea of uh, rethinking privacy, rethinking what this means. There are uh, different uh, defenders of the introduction of the so-called neuro rights. Um, there is in Chile, this has been also covered in their constitution. Um, there is, uh, on the other side, there are some um, thoughts, there are issues around bystander pri privacy, not just your own that you can potentially consent to, but also, for example, your, um, the people who may be in the same room with, with you and they don't know that um, they are being uh, also recorded with, with you. Uh, so there is a plethora of, uh, indeed, of, uh, of questions and uh, um, there are different views around the governance of that, whether um, there may be also some self-regulation, uh, self-governance self principles that could help with that, or whether we should be looking at uh, existing reinterpretation of existing hard law or introduction of a uh, new one. Um, do we have any questions? Please, the gentleman. Good morning. Thank you that I could participate in your uh, panel, town hall. It's very interesting, and especially if you talk about the uh, immersive, but what now? Life, technology, or maybe existence. And fr from that perspective, uh, uh, we in Poland, because I came from Poland, uh, we have a different consideration than now. The biggest tension is not on the freedom of expression, not even of uh, personal data, and privacy, but much more, and maybe it's only one, the future tension, freedom of conscience. Not from the religious point of view, but from the psychophysical integrity of person. And from that perspective, I, I would like to ask you if we can suggest something, how to deal with this. Also, not only it is one of the part of fundamental rights, of course, yes, but from the technical point of view, it's of course challenging, I understand this, but. I, I thought that it was worth to put the question on the table. Thank you. Was it? 
I remember chanting in one of the demonstrations in Belgium in the 1980s that the thoughts are free. Um, I don't know if the thoughts will still be free, and that's uh, freedom of conscience indeed. Of course, I don't know to which extent. Of course, w once we are starting to look into um, interaction between machine and man, and if we see that technology already enhances or has the capacity to influence our behavior, um, to which extent will it be influence our thought processes? I think our thought processes are already being influenced by uh, the <coughs> messages that we get very directly. Uh, otherwise, how could you explain that whole forms of um, the entire populations can be influenced in a certain manner? When, when I looked at the Edelman Trust Barometer, we saw, I saw that in authoritarian regimes, the trust in public service media is the highest. This seems to be contradictory, but it also is quite revealing on how a regime, and whether that be a private or a public entity, can actually influence the way people maybe not think, but at least act according to what is expected from them. So freedom of thought is definitely, uh, and, and freedom of religion, because also in the uh, European Convention of Human Rights this is enshrined, uh, are definitely things which are at stake and that would need to be looked at. Thank you. I don't know what the questions are about, but I, um, in it's my personal view. I think that uh, we are discussing now much more about the moderation, that practically uh, uh, we are discussing about content moderation, and uh, if this is should be private or, uh, or public. And uh, probably um, in order to have a certain balance, we need to have this um, multi-stakeholder moderation at some point. Uh, and and uh, this is, I think, that we are here at the Internet Governance Forum. This should be at the heart of discussions, I think, because this is, uh, this is also um, what Patrick mentioned before, democratic process cannot happen if you are not, um, if you cannot control, uh, if you don't um, have anonymity, first of all, I think that's important. If you don't have anonymity, you cannot actually exercise your rights as a citizen, I think, as well. But that's my private. <laughs> Just shortly to that, we um, we identify in the report there are this mental privacy, mental autonomy, and the practically reinterpretation of notions that we we knew like freedom of expression and what they mean nowadays with these technologies, which have the potential of even changing our not just our perception of reality, but even changing our um, thought process and even our uh, you know the facts. Thank you. Oh, hi, my name is Michael Karnikolas. I'm the executive director of the UCLA Institute for Technology, Law and Policy. I wanted to pick up on what you said about content moderation because um, as far as I understand it, the tools to moderate content effectively at scale do not exist for these technologies. So it's fine right now as long as adoption rates are, are, are where they are, but if these things take off rapidly, th there's no actual way to uh, follow the standards that exi that already exist for traditional social media platforms. So, is that something that you're looking into, or or this is this is a legal challenge and a policy challenge as well as a technical challenge? Yes, this is the yes because we will need to wrap. Please. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Steve Foster from UNICEF. We also did a short report on um, the metaverse and children and some of the rights. So, hopefully, that was useful. Um, my question is around, and sorry, maybe this is too big a question for, for this time, um, but 
I'm from South Africa originally. Um, how your your thoughts on how the metaverse will play out over time? Because not everybody can afford the five hundred or three and a half thousand dollar headset, and not everybody will. So if these technologies are going to actually scale globally, and that's also a question, but I, I think they will. But they're going to look very different for users in South Africa, in Johannesburg or Cape Town, to perhaps you know kids and obviously I'm looking at children in in New York, some children in New York. So, and perhaps we've seen some signals of this of beginning to talk to um, cloned characters, and you might be talking to them on WhatsApp. It doesn't have to be in an immersive environment, but it's beginning to normalize talking to AI basically, um, and you're not always sure if that's a a person or not. So any thoughts on how this might play out? Um, and if it, there isn't time now, I'll be here for the next few days. So I'd love to have a coffee and pick your brains. Thank, Thank you. Who would like to? I need the microphone. Yes. But I answered. Uh, uh, oh. Yeah. Melodina, Was please. it Adam who's going to go ahead? <laughs> please. Oh, so I was going to just say one thing that when we look at the metaverse, generally the standards often come from maybe the IT sector, right? Or the technology sector, but we're seeing now health coming into that. So it's really important we don't approach this in silos. Ministries across have to work together. That means health has to sit with social. If you see an impact on people and communities and society, but you also have to sit and work with technology and that's missing right now. So for example, content is being developed for schools and I don't know if there's a psychologist sociologist and in, involved i think in adam's company they do but in many cases this is not necessarily true on the case of inclusiveness these technologies will get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper so i see that actually happening because these technologies are only viable at scale that's the only way they will work but then there's this danger that they will be affordable and embedded and you cannot get rid of it think of chat gpt everyone's using it and now we're trying to figure out how can we use it more or what can we do to regulate it? So we're right now at that wonderful time. We've got a 10-year window to have these conversations and come up with the safeguards. And that's why I think these dialogues are so critical. Thank you. Thank you, Melodina. Um, and I think we, we need to, to stop here. But talking about partnerships, uh, I would like to, um, to keep your, uh, to share with you that, uh, you know, the result of the digital partnership that uh, between uh, IEEE and the Council of Europe and uh, um, stay tuned to the upcoming report on the metaverse and its impact on um, human rights, the rule of law and democracy, which is expected to be released uh, in early 2024. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to our panelists and the organizer and our hosts, of course.